Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is another exclusive series for the incredible mind of James Williams. Please as ever, let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Railroad Through Mad Ape Pass Part 1 Let's get straight into that. Pacing on top of a train car, Henry James Fisher tapped the trigger guard of his Winchester 1886 lever action rifle. The itch on top of his left foot irritated him more so now than it would have in his younger years because no matter how much he tried to scratch at it, it wouldn't go away. This was due to him now having a wooden leg and a phantom itch. Oh, it nearly drove him mad. He thought about how he'd lost his leg in the first place. The intense pain and horror of being tossed to the ground like a ragdoll after it was torn away by one of those foul beasts. The sun was setting behind the mountains on the westward side of the track. Soon the whole area would be plunged into darkness, only to then be illuminated once more by the full moon. Nature had taken back most of the land that had been cleared for the steam engine's path. What was left was only a few hundred feet from the wood line to the other. This was as far as the track had gone before it was abandoned, train and all, and rerouted around the mountains. All records of its location, the company that attempted to build it, the men who worked on it, and the events that had transpired here had been destroyed in hopes that no one would go looking. One man did more than that. He returned to Mad Ape Pass because he had a score to settle. His thoughts were interrupted though when he heard the all too familiar hooting. To Rails End 40 years earlier. Henry yawned from boredom. Life of a US cavalryman wasn't as exciting as he thought it'd be. Up to this point, they were glorified babysitters for the railroad, following the ever-moving town as they broke ground and laid track. Most of what they did was to serve eviction notices to landowners that happened to put down roots in the path of the railroad. Nothing was going to stop the Iron Beast in its trek across the US, competing with the one being built to the north by the Union Pacific. Other than that, it was breaking up bar fights and investigating murders since there was no formal form of law enforcement on the frontier. Now this new assignment, find the crew at Rail's End that had never returned after what was only supposed to be a few days work, as well as the runner that had been sent out to make contact a few days prior, but hadn't reported back. All I'm saying is, this ain't no job for the army. Well, it's bad enough we're lapdogs to this railroad company. Now we're being sent off like some errand boy. Oliver groaned. I agree, but orders are orders, and at least we're not kicking some poor farmer off their land. Henry replied. Besides, aren't you concerned about the man working on a railroad? He asked and Oliver scoffed. Huh, honestly, I don't care, he said harshly. Mostly Irish, former slave owners and ex-slaves. Huh, bet they're getting on nicely. Regardless, they're easily replaceable. He said, but Henry raised a brow. Aren't you Irish? He asked, grinning at the joke. You watch your whore mouth, Fisher, Oliver replied in a slightly thicker Scottish accent than usual. Can it, you two? We're getting close to camp. Everyone keep an eye out. Colonel Adams called from the front of the line. There were twenty of them in total, all on horseback, armed with repeaters and sharps rifles and single-action Colt Army issues. Every man was a decent shot on the range, but most of them were untested in battle. Adams was the only one that had fought in the Civil War, and a couple of the others had to draw down in self-defence. Other than that, it was a bunch of greenhorns, and this included Henry, who only joined because he was bored with the posh life of a senator's son. 
He wanted an adventure, but joining the army and going out to the Wild West wasn't all it had been cracked up to be. They could see a faint plume of smoke above the trees around the next bend. It didn't take long before the camp came into view, but the sight made the company stop before getting any closer. Most tents in the foreman's rail car had been burned. What tents remained standing were torn and splattered with blood. And there were patches of grass around the camp that had been covered in blood as well, and the smell of death and burned flesh had lingered in the air. Spread out, look for survivors and evidence of what happened. Adam said and everyone pulled their rifles from their scabbards, cocking them and spreading out to see what they could find. Oliver and Henry rode close together towards the middle of the camp. Evidence of what happened? It's obvious what happened, Oliver said, low but loud enough for Henry to hear him. A raiding party surprised them, killed everyone, took the horses and supplies, he continued. Well, Henry shook his head. I don't think so. Look, most of the supplies are here and the guns, he said, pointing around them. Also, where are the bodies? Natives take scalps, not whole bodies, he said, and then stood around the gut pile of what could only have been a horse. And they don't do this to horses, he said, pointing to it before swatting away some of the flies that are scattered from the rotting flesh. Oliver was going to give his opinion, but seeing and smelling the putrid meat, his complexion turned a bit green. Oh, it was so bad it made him cover his mouth and rendered him speechless for some time. Silent Morning A further search turned up a few body parts that looked like that had been torn or chewed off. Oh, it made no sense to anyone since there would still be bodies if they had been scavenged on. In the end, most agreed that natives hadn't done this, but there were no known animals that could either. More curiously, drag marks were leading into the woods nearby, but the trails were lost not too far in. A commotion at the far end of camp got everyone's attention. Henry and Oliver arrived to find one of their men restraining a rail man. He was struggling hard to get away, screaming incoherently. More soldiers joined in, one finally striking him over the head and knocking him unconscious. Ah, secure him. We'll set up camp here for the night and continue the search at daybreak, Adam said and the men got to work setting up camp. After the sun went down, sentries were selected and the men turned in for the night. No fires or lamps were lit and noise was kept to a minimum so as to not draw attention to them. Henry and Oliver had been on first watch with nothing out of the ordinary happening. After being relieved, they headed for their tent and were asleep rather quickly. Henry's dreams were, hmm, were unsettling to say the least. He had visions of wild men deep in the forest coming down from the mountains to kill him and his companions and then dragging them off to a dismal abyss. Waking up just before dawn, they both laid on their bedrolls, staring at the roof for a long moment before speaking. Did you hear that? Oliver asked. Yeah, uh, it's a little too quiet out there. You think we'd hear birds or something? Henry replied. They dressed quickly and stepped out of the tent. A few others were already up, along with the last watch rotation. Hey boys, you see anything out there? Oliver asked as he approached the forming group. No, one of the watchmen said nervously, with an uneasy look on his face. I never saw anything, but I swear, felt like I was being watched and I kept hearing an owl hooting. Or it wasn't like any owl I've ever heard. Another sentry said, though no one thought that this was all that odd. Well, how about this morning? Has anyone heard anything at all? Well, it just seems a bit too quiet. Henry asked and there was a long pause as everyone listened. Well, it was dead silent. That is kind of strange, said one of the men. Oliver tapped Henry's arm and pointed towards Colonel Adam's tent as the commanding officer stepped out and adjusted his hat. Henry nodded and headed over to him, saluting him before speaking. Sir, it's awfully quiet out. Doesn't bode well, he said, getting an annoyed stare in reply as Adams pushed past him without acknowledging him further. Sentries, report in. The rest of you get started on breaking camp and prepare 
to mount up. He ordered. Seven of the eight men that had taken the last shift stood in attention before Adams, while the rest got to work. A frown then crossed his face. Where is Miller? He asked the highest ranking member of the group. I don't know, sir. He was making another round by the wood line before. You caught us over. Adams groaned. Anything to report? He asked. N no, sir. It was all quiet last night, and a few men reported hearing strange hooting and feeling like they were being watched, but that's all, said the ranking sentry. Good. Go find Miller and tell him to get his ass back here. We're leaving in half an hour. Adams said, dismissing the men before heading off to question a man that was found the day before. Henry asked Oliver to finish up while he went to see what the rail man had to say. His friend agreed that Henry slipped off to the tent the man had been held in. Jethro! Henry caught the answer to a question he had not heard. What happened here? Adams asked. We, we were attacked by monsters, Jethro said in a distressed tone. Savages, you mean? The natives? Adams asked. No, monsters! Actual goddamn monsters! Jethro said and started sobbing. And where is everybody else? Adams asked, not pushing the previous question. Dead, torn apart, eaten or dragged off. Jeffro said, taking a sip of water from a canteen before continuing. A couple of weeks ago, there came a hooting and whooping in the night. The hunters never came back and a few other men went missing, but we couldn't spare the men for a search party. Besides, people walk off the job all the time. And then the night we set up camp here, they attacked. They came from every direction, big, ugly things. They looked like men but taller and built like a brick shit house. They were all hairy all over with big teeth and claws. I was about to grab my rifle when a wagon was flipped over on top of me. I climbed out some time later after it was all over. Jeffrey paused, wiping his face with a rack. We need to get out of here. Go back to town and tell everyone. Then, then, then reroute the... <coughs> Choking sounds were heard. His sentence was cut off with the sound of a struggle. Henry looked inside and, to his shock, Adams was strangling the man with a piece of loose rope from the tent lashings. He wasn't sure what to do, and by the time he decided to help the poor man, it was over. Adams tied the rope high and started for the door, making Henry back away quickly. As Adams came out, Henry froze, as did the colonel. After a short moment of awkward silence, Henry cleared his throat and spoke. <clears throat> so, how's our detainee? Henry asked, a little nervousness in his voice. He hung himself, Adams said in a stern tone, his right hand resting on the grip of his revolver, and Henry nodded. Ah, oh, what a shame. Guess we'll never know what happened here, he said, turned and walked back to where Oliver was finishing up and saddling his horse. Well, Oliver asked. Not now, Henry replied and got his things in order. Half an hour later, camp was broken and everyone had mounted up. There was still one empty horse. Adams trotted his horse around looking over his men, and seeing the horse with no rider or saddle made him groan in frustration. Ah, where the hell is Miller? He bellowed out, but no one answered. Find him, now! He yelled and everyone paired up and headed off in different directions. Once again, Oliver and Henry went together to see what they could find. If there was anything to find. So, Oliver asked. He's dead. Henry replied sternly. Died in the night? How? Oliver questioned. No, Adams killed him. Henry answered. What? Why? Oliver exclaimed. Shh, keep it down. Look, he said the camp was attacked by monsters. Seemed rather convinced of it. Suggested we turn back, but the colonel strangled him and made it look like a suicide. Henry said and Oliver stared at him in disbelief. Henry swallowed hard and then spoke in a hushed, nervous tone. I'm not saying that I believe him, but 
If we're the real man, Jeffro said it's true. We won't find Mello, and we'll probably meet a similar fate. Oliver pursed his lips, but didn't say anything. The two continued to look for the missing man, but as Henry predicted, found nothing. After an hour, the search was called off with no sign of Miller being found. As a matter of fact, though, several of the searchers passed right by his body, hanging in the crook of a tree. All they had to do was look up and they would have seen it. Miller's kit, as well as what weapons and supplies that could be found, was stowed on his horse. The 19 Romanian men rode back through the rail camp and further down the trail in search of any survivors. More Missing Souls The men rode at a leisurely pace for several hours along the trail of cleared forest. The stumps of downed trees were getting progressively fresher as they neared the area that the logging crew was supposed to be. Stacks of timber lined the road, waiting to be loaded and hauled away. Some were meant to be milled and used as rail ties. The rest were to be sold as lumber. It was a clever way to ease the burden of costs for the railroad. These logs should have been long gone, yet here they were. Adams held up his hand, halting the men. Ahead was a line of wagons in various stages of loading, but it looked like they'd been sitting this way for a while. He also noticed some of the logs were strewn about and thought it odd. More odd than that was the fact that there was no horses or men and no sound. Dismount. Let's move these wagons and keep going. Adams ordered and the men got down. Most went to move the wagons while others stood guard. They first had to be emptied and then lifted from the mud and set on solid ground. Only then would they roll off to the side of the trail. In a few short minutes, the first cart was moved. Henry pushed away from his position once it was clear of the road and looked at his white glove. Blood? He muttered to himself and then looked at the wagon. There was indeed a darker stain to where he had his hands. And then something else caught his eye. Four deep gouges in the seat like something clawed its way across it. He then started noticing other things. More claw marks in the logs, horse straps that had been snapped, bullet holes, broken or abandoned guns, and empty cartridge cases. Uh, sir, Henry said, looking at Adams, and holding up his hand and pointing to the places of interest. Adams looked at what Henry had found and nodded. Same as Rouse End, or the more reason to push on. He said, though Henry didn't agree. Sir, I, I don't think... He started, but Adams cut him off. No, you don't think. You do. Do as you are ordered. Now get those wagons off this road, Adams said. Henry pursed his lips. He wanted to protest, but he knew it would do no good. And so he did, as he was told, and moved on to the next cart. As he scanned the area, he saw more of the same. There was blood, spent casings, weapons laying about, but no bodies. After an hour... The road was clear, weapons of the missing men gathered, and onward they marched. It didn't take long to reach the end of the logging trail. Just like Rail's End and the logging road, there was no one here, save for Jethro. Tools, equipment and weapons were aplenty, but no men, no horses, and no sound. The soldiers' horses were beginning to act a bit unnerved, now. But being war horses, they didn't protest as much as they normally would have. Instead of speaking the order, Adams held up a hand and motioned in a circle, telling the men to spread out and look around. Dried patches of blood and gore dotted the area, just like before, but there was no sign of survivors. Adams waved to one of his officers and spoke to him in private. The conversation was brief, ended with the officer nodding and calling over two others, and the three of them riding back the way they had come. Farlin, Adams called and the remaining soldiers gathered. I've sent Davison, Price and Turner back to report in and request reinforcements. We're going to hold this position until they return with the numbers and we'll comb these woods until we find the missing men or the ones that murdered them. He said, pausing to let the news sink in. Settle in, boys. We're going to be here for a few days. Adams said and everyone split off to set up camp. Henry looked to his friend Oliver shaking his head before dismounting and pulling his kit down. Preparing for the worst. <laughs>
It didn't take Henry and Oliver long to set up their tent near the center of the clearing. Ollie, go to Miller's horse and grab a couple of extra rifles. Maybe a shotgun or two as well. Check that they're loaded, he said in a low tone. Why? You think we're going to have trouble? Oliver asked. I don't know. I just I'd like to have a little more firepower on hand, he said as he took his and Oliver's things into the tent. Oliver nodded and headed over to the riderless horse and pulled out a couple of repeaters, a double barrel shotgun and three revolvers. Luckily, none of them had been fired. Everyone else was too busy to notice him slip away with the guns and ducking into the tent. I got him, Hent. He froze, covered nose to nose with Adams, called red-handed with an armload of guns. Adams looked down on the weapons, over to Henry, who was standing with his head lowered, and then back to Oliver. Carry on, Adams said, stepping around Oliver and out of the tent. Oliver, who had stopped breathing at the sight of Adams, finally gasped in relief and handed Henry one of the rifles. What was he doing here? He asked. Henry took the repeater and looked it over. Uh, he gave me a full commission, Henry said, sounding surprised at the news himself. Oliver stared at his friend for a moment and then scoffed a laugh. Huh, congrats then, he said, slapping Henry's arm and sitting on his bedroll. Henry and Oliver divided the guns, each getting the extra rifle and pistol. Oliver took the other revolver and gave Henry the shotgun. They squirreled away the guns in their tent and then headed out to prep their horses for a long stay. As they removed the saddles and bridles, Henry paused. What if we need to beat a hasty retreat? He asked, and Oliver looked over with a shrug. Ah, we can always bear back it. Natives do it all the time. He replied, but Henry wasn't fully convinced. Ah, let's hitch him a bit closer to our tents. He suggested, to which Oliver nodded, and they did just that. Not long after they and a few others were the only ones still up, keeping watch for the first few hours of the night, just as they had done the previous night. Visitors in the Night One by one, the first watch left off to wake their replacements and go to bed themselves. Once Oliver and Henry were back in their tent, they laid on their beds, but Henry was restless. Oliver, who had his eyes closed for several minutes, let out a sigh. Oh, what is it? he asked. Oh, it's too damn quiet, Henry said. So, Oliver replied. And so, when have you not heard anything? It's like this forest is devoid of life. Henry replied and they both remained silent. As he said, there was no sound and, admittedly, it had been that way for as long as Oliver could remember. Yeah, but still, you two worked up over it. There were plenty of silent nights back on the farm. You city slickers wouldn't know anything about it. Oliver teased and yawned. Henry smirked. Fine, fine, you're right, he said and let out a deep breath. Ah, <sighs> night, he said. Mm-hmm, Oliver replied before snoring lightly. Henry's eyes cracked open at a distant, indistinct sound. He couldn't figure out what it was in his half-asleep stupor. And finally, waking up enough to sit up and listen closely, it sounded like the first part of an owl hooting, but deeper and repetitive. Then came another sound, a response. It was different, like chattering followed by another barrage of hooting from a different direction than the first. Ollie! Ollie! He said quietly, but his friend kept sleeping. Oliver! Henry said a bit louder, slapping his leg. Oliver spun over and cocked the hammer on one of his revolvers. What? He said, looking around in confusion. Shh! Listen! Henry replied, holding up a finger. Hearing the noises, Oliver groaned. First you bother by no sound, and now you bother by sounds? He complained, laying back down and cocking the pistol. A roar let out in the darkness and was immediately followed by a scream and a gunshot and more screams. The two shot to their feet, arming themselves and left the tent. 
and within moments every man was out in at arms, looking around for what was happening. The desperate screams of one of the men drew everyone to one end of the camp until everyone was gathered where the sentry was supposed to be. His screams and pleading faded deeper into the forest, but no one was willing to go in after him. And finally, the screams stopped and the hooting picked back up, and this time from every direction. It lasted for several minutes before a deep, guttural roar forced them into silence, simultaneously making the men jump in a flinch. Adams pushed through the crowd, stepping closer to the woodline, gun in one hand and a burning torch in the other. No one said a word, not even a battle-hardened colonel. As Adams stepped back, a rock half the size of his head flew by, just missing him but striking one of the soldiers in the gut. The man crumpled in a heap, causing a few others to fire blindly into the woods. Hold your fire! Adams bellowed, and the shooting halted. Secure the perimeter. Build fires every ten yards around camp. Everyone is on watch till the morning, Adams said, but nobody moved. Sir, shouldn't we leave? asked one of the privates. Did I say pack up? No, I said dig in. Now move! He shouted, and the men set to work. Everyone worked in double time to better prepare the camp. The sun began to rise as they finished up building the barricades and piling stacks of wood to be used for fires the next night. Every log and wagon had been set up in defensive positions, and anything too small to build these makeshift walls was to be burned. The horses were moved to the centre of camp, and the men divided up between morning and afternoon shifts. One would sleep through the morning while the other took the afternoon, but no one slept at night. It went on like this for a week. Every night they were haunted by the hooting in the darkness, shadowy figures passing by just beyond the fire's lights and the occasional rock throw. A Strange Sighting As the second week rolled in, the men were getting restless. Food, including what they'd scavenged for the rails end camp and here at the end of the logging trail, was just about gone. Any attempt to persuade the colonel that they should go back to town was shut down. One man saddled up his horse and tried to leave camp. He didn't make it 40 yards before Adams fired a single round from his repeater, unsaddling the rider, who then lay motionless on the ground. Adams ordered everyone to remain in camp before turning and going back to his tent. Henry, Oliver, and a few others watched for a moment as the horse trotted on. Everyone but Henry slowly turned and headed back to their stations. The horse finally disappeared around the bend and Henry sighed, turned, and took a few steps. A distant roar and screeching whinny made him look back in a direction it had gone, freezing in place when his eyes fell on a man. No, no, not a man. He wasn't sure what it was, but he was tall, muscular, and covered in golden brown hair or fur. It had a human-like face that was calm, if not uninterested. He looked down at the dead man, squatting to investigate the body before standing and looking back at Henry for a moment, and then disappearing back into the forest. Henry had been too shocked to react or move for some time. His first instinct was to tell his best friend, but... How could he tell him what he saw without coming off like a crazy person? Henry decided to keep it to himself, for the time being, returning to his post until the end of his shift. He found that he wasn't hungry, instead needing a smoke to try and calm his nerves. Sitting on a barrel turned makeshift stool, he packed his father's pipe and hung it from his lips as he pulled out a box of matches. Striking one, he set it to the tobacco and puffed it until it was well lit and shaking out the match and tossing it to the side. He took a deep draw from the pipe and let it out slowly. He could feel the shakiness in his hands subside a little, and so he continued to smoke. He thought about the thing he'd seen, wondering why it seemed so placid in comparison to what he'd been experiencing thus far. The tent flap opened and Oliver stepped in, catching a face full of smoke. <coughs> really, brother? Do you have to smoke that in here? He said a bit annoyed, leaving a flap open so the tent could air out a bit. Well, I stow it, 
I need this, Henry replied, still in deep thought. I have a theory on that stuff, Oliver said pointing to the pipe. Well, Henry, he welcomed the distraction from the previous thought and turned to his friend. Really? Well, let's have it, he said, taking another few draws. I had a pair of uncles, twins on my father's side. Well, they were alike in every way. They ate the same, drank the same, did the same job. The only difference between them two is one smoked and the other didn't. Mickey, the smoker, well, he died at 38 while Angus lived on to be 54. Oliver said, but Henry just stared at him, continuing to smoke. Your point? he asked. My point is, I think smoking is bad for you. And if you keep puffing away on that thing, well, that's going to kill you one day. Oliver said rather grimly. Henry paused in his smoking and raised a brow. After a moment, he sighed. Ah, fine, if it'll make you feel better. He said, tapping a pipe on the side of the barrel, dumping the smoldering contents onto the ground. Oliver nodded. Ah, you'll thank me later, he said with a smug smile. Well, Henry rolled his eyes and stuck the pipe back in his kit. A roar echoed through camp, causing the two of them to shoot out of their tent to see what was going on. The hooting and whooping was back, accompanied by snarls and growls from within the woodline. They had previously only heard these sounds at night, but now it was the middle of the day. The two ducked back into the tent and gathered their pilfered arms. Ollie, Henry started. If something happens to me... Ah, shut it. I don't want to hear that crap from you. Oliver interrupted. Henry laughed nervously and nodded, and the two of them stepped back out of the tent and went to one of the barricades. Ah, things get too hot. We'll make for the horses. We'll ride like hell. Oliver said in a low tone so that none of the others heard him. He was sure they had the same idea, but if they didn't, he didn't want to give it to them. Henry nodded, and the two of them readied themselves for what was to come. Though no amount of readiness would have prepared them for what was about to happen next. As if to taunt them even more, a light rain began to fall, and with a drizzle and a light breeze that swelled the logging camp came the pungent odour of wet animals, death, urine, and feces. God, what is that? Henry said in disgust. Oliver remained quiet, staring intently at the woodline, watching for any hint of movement. There, he whispered, pointing with his rifle. Henry followed his gaze and felt a wave of horror wash over him as something walked out of the woods. It was big, like the thing he'd seen earlier, but different. This one had a rusty brown fur that was wiry. Its arms were longer, ending with clawed hands. His face was more animal-like, with a long blunt snout and four oversized canines. It looked like one of the monkeys he'd read about, but at that moment, in his state of shock, he couldn't recall the species. That's what Jeffro said he saw. A goddamn monster, Henry said, feeling sick to his stomach. As someone else noticed the beast, screamed and fired. The shot missed, striking a tree behind it and sending it into a fit of rage. The creature charged the line and was met with a hail of gunfire. I was struck multiple times and collapsed onto the ground. A roar from the other side of camp caught everyone's attention and they rushed to meet it, seeing another of these things coming at them and the men aimed and fired, dropping it halfway from the wood line to the camp. Now, sounds of fury erupted from all around them as dozens of these things came rushing from the forest in every direction. The Railroad Through Mad Ape Pass Part 2 Let's get straight into that. Every three days, Henry had to pump the handcar out to this remote area to bring the supplies he would need. He'd learned how to cover his scent from these monsters, using a resin of evergreens, and only travelled in a day since they seemed to be more active at night. Still, it was risky, and he had to have more than a few close calls or encounters along the way 
These encounters almost always ended with him killing or at least injuring one or two of the creatures unless he was able to escape and evade them. And with each encounter, he'd take a few more weeks or months break to let things die down before resuming his hobby. As a result, it took several years to complete. And when the hooting started, Henry looked up and scanned the tree line on either side of the train. The sound would come from one side and then the other. It was as if they were communicating with each other. <sighs> he took a deep breath, dropped the lever to check that there was a round in the chamber, resetting it against the grip. His heart was beating faster now as the reality of what was about to happen set in. The years of preparation for this very moment had been hard. He'd almost given up a few times, but the nightmares he had on a almost nightly basis encouraged him to press on. Murderous Monsters If the logging crew had come a month earlier or a month later, none of this would have happened. The troop of migrating Gugwe would have passed through the area and been gone before the crew arrived or found a clearing where there hadn't been one before. They would have found it curious, but were used to the ever-changing scenery of the forest. As it were, the crew were working away when the troop arrived, finding the intruders and harassing them for a few days before attacking. They overwhelmed them with numbers, killing and devouring the humans with ease. After wiping out the logging crew, they followed the trail through the forest, finding a hauling team dispatching them since there were far fewer of them than the first group they encountered. Eventually, they found the rail end camp. The larger group of humans gave them a bit of pause, but after a time of harassing and probing their defences, the attack came and they, once again, feasted. The introduction of these frail intruders put the alphas on edge, and so the troop remained nearby to assert their dominance over this territory once more. When the soldiers arrived, scouts kept a close eye on them. Though few in number, they recognised that every man in this group carried the weapons that spouted fire and thunder. This meant that they were more prepared and thus harder to overtake in a single charge, and so picking them off one by one or two at a time was the preferred method. That is, until they had them cornered and surrounded. Now outnumbering them three to one and a lot of hungry mouths to feed. The moment the second Gugwe dropped, the Alpha Mal roared, signalling to attack. Logging Camp Massacre The men spread out, reloading on the way back to their posts, and began firing on the advancing monsters. The light drizzle became a steady rain, making the ground slick with mud. The noise of roaring monsters, screaming men, gunfire, and neighing horses made it nearly impossible to understand a man right next to you, much less hear orders being shouted to retreat by an already fleeing Adams. And with the sighting of the first monster, he headed for his horse, unhitching the whole line at once, mounted up and took off. Only those closest to him heard the order, but most of the men, oh, they remained on the line. In under a minute, the line was broken and the camp overrun. War cries turned to screams of pain and terror as the men were grabbed up and savagely killed. Henry and Oliver had started for the horses before this had taken place, but were too late since Adams had turned their only means to escape loose. And looking around, the two tried to work out what to do next, but there was so much carnage that neither could think straight. Ah, let's just book it, Oliver suggested, pointing at an opening in the commotion. Henry looked and nodded, and the two started to make a run for it. Henry heard the pain gasp of his friend and was forced to the ground. Rolling over, he saw that Oliver had been knocked down, running into him in the process, and was now being dragged back by one of those things. No! he shouted, taking aim with his Colt revolver and fired the whole cylinder. Five of the six shots hit it, striking it at its arm, chest, neck, and the final shot going right through its eye socket. The beast toppled over backwards and fell dead onto the ground. The moment he let go, Oliver scrambled to his feet and turned, ready to shoot it again, if needed. Again, they made their break for it, but their path was blocked by the biggest of these brutes, the Alpha Male, who just watched them kill one of his troop. 
They let out a tremendous roar and charged them. Henry swung his second rifle around while Oliver drew two pistols. They fired up until it met them and none of their rounds seeming to have much effect. And with one backhand, the Alpha Gugwe sent the two of them flying and rolling in the mud and grass. Oliver managed to get to his feet first, but was snatched up by the monster. Henry was gasping for breath, and when he looked up and saw his friend being held at the shoulders, kicking, flailing, and screaming as his arms and ribs were broke under the pressure. And with a roar, the big male clamped down onto Oliver's face, biting down and tearing away his flesh. All his screams were gurgled as his throat filled with blood. And with another roar, it released one side and took him by the legs and bashed him onto the ground like a fleshy club. It held up the mangled, broken body and then threw it to the side. It had happened so fast that Henry had had a chance to react to try and save his best friend, his brother. But now the beast's focus was on him. Henry scrambled back, tearing at the ground, trying to crawl away. Sear and pain in his leg made him scream and look back to see that it had him by the foot. Its claws had slashed his calf. Its grip now crushed his foot and ankle as it pulled him back and lifted him up. Its other hand grabbed his thigh and pulled the leg tight before biting down just below the knee and crushing the bones in its jaw. Henry screamed in pain and terror, punching and kicking with his other leg. And the Gugwe paid Henry's attempts to free himself, no mind pulling the lower half of his leg away and swallowing a mouthful of flesh at the same time. A lucky blow landed on the beast's snout, making it toss Henry and stumble back snorting and snarling. Henry crawled once more in desperation, dragging his severed leg through the mud. His hand landed on something and he looked to see that it was a double-barreled shotgun. It hadn't been fired yet and so he picked it up at that moment, he resolved himself to die. If only it meant killing the thing that had killed his friend. It would be worth it. The Gugwe cleared his head and roared as it charged at Henry, who waited till it was right on top of him to act. And rolling over onto his back, he cocked the hammers, pointed up, pointing the barrels at the beast's mouth as it came at him, and pulled both triggers. The buckshot tore through its skull and brain blowing out the back of its head in a spray of red and pink chunks. I had dropped to its knees and fell forward on top of Henry before he could get out of the way. Its forehead impacted on his own, dazing him as he tried to pull himself free but to no avail. The Gugwe on top of him was just too heavy. He felt tired now as the adrenaline started to fade as well as the bloodlust from his mangled leg. And the last thing he saw was his fellow cavalrymen being torn apart and eaten alive before all went black. A time of healing. Henry was in and out of consciousness for some time. How long, he wasn't sure, but it felt like it had been days at least. When he first came to, it was to the sound of moans and cries of men still being slaughtered. Next was just the crunching of bone and tearing of flesh. The third time was as the weight was lifted from him and he opened his eyes to see one of those things dragging the body of the one he'd killed away. He looked back at him but he quickly shut his eyes and remained motionless and out he went again. Once Henry finally woke up enough to sit up and tie off his leg with his belt, he guessed it hadn't been too long since the monsters had left and so he gave a quick look around. The camp was destroyed. There were no bodies but lots of blood and entrails. He dared not call out but looked for any signs of any other survivors. And there were none. He went lightheaded and fell back into the mud, passing out once more. After a short while, he felt himself being lifted by what felt like a warm blanket. His eyes cracked and he saw the face of a very large... man? No, not a man. It was one of the things he'd seen before. He then realised he was in his arms, like a child. He lacked the energy to fight and, at this point, no longer cared if he died. Awaken again, he could hear chanting, drumming and rattling. He looked around 
seeing he was surrounded by natives. The tugging at his leg made him look down and see that they were cutting away the lower portion. All at once, burning pain shot over him as he jerked back and screamed in agony. The chanting never stopped, but he was held down and a leather strap stuck into his mouth before he passed out once more. A week later, he sat up from the bed he was in, pulling the hide blankets off to see that he no longer had his left leg from the knee down. A woman stepped in and knelt beside him, setting a bowl down and motioning for him to eat. He nodded and picked up some of the food and ate it. Well, it wasn't that good, but he was too hungry to turn down a meal. He ate a few pinches and then laid back down, exhausted from the little activity he'd just performed. And this, this went on for another week as he tried to communicate with his caretakers. None of the ones he came in contact with seemed to know English, but understood him enough to tend to his needs. And finally, he managed to pull himself up when a crutch was brought to him. He stepped outside into the bright sun which hurt his eyes and looked around. He was in a village of what looked like a hundred or so people. They were busy with their duties but stopped what they were doing to either watch him from afar or approach to examine him closer. And he was led to a hut at the center of the camp and told, to his understanding, to go inside. A time of learning. As he stepped in, he looked around at the group of elders as well as the thing that had been carrying him. And strangely, he wasn't afraid. Maybe it was the fact that if he had wanted to kill him, it already would have. It was also that none of the natives were afraid, so there was no need to be. And he was shown a place to sit and helped into it. A pipe was lit and passed around and Words were spoken, but he still didn't understand them. And finally, all but one of the elders and the creature left. You, you have big medicine, the elder said, and Henry's eyes widened. You, you speak English? he asked. A little, enough to tell a white man not to build railroad through the mountains, the elder said, smoking from the pipe. But what do I know? I am just a savage, he said with a chuckle. Well, Henry wasn't amused, but smiled anyway. I don't suppose it speaks, he asked, pointing to the creature sitting with them. No, but he understands well enough, the elder said. I call him grandfather. His people were protecting the soldier camp until one of your own killed another. Well, Henry raised a brow. Protecting us? From those other things? He asked and the elder nodded. What were they? Why did they attack us? He asked and the elder frowned. It is their way. They kill and eat everything in their path, even their own that fall. He said and smoked the pipe some more, offering it to Henry, who took it and smoked it as well. It reminded him of the last conversation he'd had with his best friend, almost making him break down in tears. And sniffling, he wiped his eyes and passed the pipe back. I'm Henry, Henry James Fisher. Over the next week, he learned how to manage to survive. The caked on mud hid his form while the stench of the dead Gugway masked his scent. It was a stroke of luck that the grandfather had almost stepped on him. Standing Bear explained how he brought him to the village, nearly dead. They'd never seen anyone survive an attack from the Gugway or face eaters. It was because of the good way that Standing Bear had warned not to build through the valley, but had been ignored. And during that conversation, Henry thought of Rail's end. It had been a long time since he and his men had left. He wondered if they had sent out another search party, or if Adams had made it back. Either way, he had to report in, and so it was time to go. Returning to town. Henry was now used to walking with a crutch and was ready to go home. His usefulness to the army was pretty much well done, but he still had to report in. Weighing his options, Henry waited that if he told the truth about what happened, he would be shipped off to an asylum. He would just have to come up with something before making it back to Rail's End and set to work preparing for the journey. <laughs> 
and Stanimber assured him that Grandfather's people would watch over him until he was safe from the Gugwe, though it was unlikely that he'd even know that they were there. However, his own people were about to move their village in fear of reprisals for what the Gugwe had done, and so no one could be spared at the time. Henry donned what was left of his uniform, a few trinkets and furs given to him by his caretakers and a single repeater rifle that belonged to Standing Bear. He was honoured to be given this weapon. After saying goodbyes, Henry set off to return to where the attack had taken place, and from there he would backtrack to town. This was part of a plan he was formulating to explain being gone for so long. He wasn't sure if he'd be believed, but it was worth a shot. Henry was scared shitless the whole way back to where the massacre had taken place. He could smell the stench of decay before seeing the clearing. Stopping at the wood line to look around before stepping out, there were crows and vultures scattered around, pecking up whatever remains they could find. And working the action on the rifle, he started to let off a shot, but thought better of it. He knew he was being guarded by grandfather's people, but it still didn't make sense to draw attention to himself. He looked around for whatever supplies he could take, but took very little since it was a long way back on foot. He found that he and Ollie's tent was mostly intact and stepped inside. It wasn't much salvageable, but he did find his pipe and a few pinches worth of tobacco. He put them into his sack and stepped back out, jumping at the sight of Grandfather standing just a few yards away. Ah, for a big fella, you sure are quiet, he said with a chuckle. Grandfather remained his usual stoic self and just pointed to the direction Henry needed to be going. Yeah, 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 I'm going, Henry said and hobbled out of camp. I don't suppose you carry me again, he asked, looking back, but Grandfather, well, he was gone. It took four days longer to make it back to Rail's End than it had for his company to make it out to the logging camp. This was mostly due to the one leg, frequent stops to rest, and the fact he didn't have a horse this time. Along the way, he found blood patches in the open areas along the trail. He figured the Gugwe had hunted some wild game, but then he found the guns and torn bits of uniform stained with blood. He recognised them as belonging to the men Adams had sent back, but never returned. Three men on horses left, two large and three small patches of blood. He guessed that one of the horses had gotten away. This thought was crushed when he found another large blood patch just a few hundred yards further up the trail. In smoke over the hill, Henry smiled as he knew he was almost there. His smile faded when he looked up and saw vultures circling above and swooping down behind the hill. His gut turned and heart raced as he hobbled quickly up the last hill and looked out over Rail's End. Immediately, he turned, doubled over and heaved. The whole town, it was decimated. Smoke arose from the burned down husks of tents and buildings that had been built when the town caught up with camp. Henry sobbed, dropping to his knee and stump. What was he going to do now? The Fall of Rails End A few days after the soldiers departed to discover the fate of the Rails End camp, orders came, by way of telegraph, to proceed with the moving of town. Every man, woman and child old enough to help out had a job to do. Still, it took three days before everything was broken down, stored or stacked and ready to move out. No one used wagons or went off on their own since this was no native territory. The train clanked along at a steady pace, snaking its way through the valley. At a fork in a dirt road next to the track, the train turned right. Left would have taken them north and around the mountain, the route suggested by Standing Bear. But right was a shortcut through what was loosely translated as Mad Ape Pass. As the train reached the end of the track, it slowed to a stop. Gasps and hushed words droned on, in a dull roar as people saw the state of the camp. Men dropped from each side of the train, weapons drawn and scattered across the field. No one was allowed to get off before the area was cleared. And after an hour, the townsfolk disembarked to clean up the area before setting up their own shops 
It was figured that the Rao crew had been attacked by savages and the soldiers, or was left with the Rao men who had gone after them. And putting town together took less time than it did to take down since everyone was in a hurry to get back to work with the regular day-to-day. -day. Uh, they were also eager to get into cover in case they were being watched. And they were indeed being watched, but not by the kind of savage that they assumed. And several Gugway scouts watched the humans, and one headed back to where the rest of the troop were tearing apart the soldiers. Upon learning of this new, larger group of humans in their territory, the newly asserted Mao Alpha gave the signal to finish up and follow him. The whole troop crested the hill just after midnight. The sound of a light rumble made a few people come out and see if there was a stampede. And that is when the whooping and roaring started. Well, most of the town was built mostly from canvas tents, and these did little to slow the Gugwe as they ripped their way inside and slaughtered anyone they found within. And those on the far end of town heard the screams and grabbed their weapons but were not fully prepared for what they were about to come into contact with. It didn't take long for the town people to realise that they needed to band together if they stood any hope of surviving. And everyone made for the train, piling into the cars and barricading them as best they could. They shot through open gaps left in the windows and doors, only opening up to take in more survivors. It was hard to watch, as now and then someone would make a break from their hiding place to the train, only to be tackled and torn apart by one or more of these beasts. And the Gugway sacked the town, thoroughly ripping everything apart in search of a straggler. Eventually, though all attention was on the train, no one had seen the conductor, and so it was assumed that he had been killed already. And without anyone to operate the train, all they could do was try and wait it out. Oh, there was no food, and ammo was running out. Children cried for their parents, and parents for their children that they had lost in the chaos. A few were reunited, but the death toll was staggering. In a little more than an hour, over 60% of the town was gone. Those that remained huddled in the train cars, hoping to be rescued. Day came and went without a sight or sound from the monsters that had attacked them the night before. Well, there was no way to be sure that they had gone other than leaving the cars, but no one was willing to do that. And finally someone spoke up. It was the conductor. He had hidden in a crate the moment the first screams woke him from sleep. Well, he had been a coward before, but wanted to make up for it now. And he requested that five men go with him so he could start the train and get them the hell out of there. Three volunteered, but no more. They would have to climb into and across the wood car to get to the engine. It would take about an hour to fire it up and build enough pressure to get moving. And getting there was easy. It took only a few minutes. The engine was still warm, but still, an hour might as well have been a week. The conductor was about to strike a match when he looked out of the front window. Not three feet from it, and staring back at him, was the Alpha. At the same time, it let out a roar, and he screamed, turning to scramble back up the woodpile and shoving one of his guards down to the ground. The poor man broke his leg on impact and was unable to recover before he was set upon by the Alpha. The other two men opened fire, but only let out a couple of shots before being grabbed up from behind and pulled from the mound of wood by a pair of Gugwe that had snuck up from the other side. The conductor was now at the door begging for it to be opened. Those inside the car that weren't busy firing on the monsters now descended on them, or cowering in fear, tried to keep the door closed. The conductor had almost managed to get in when he was suddenly and violently yanked back out. His screams were quickly silenced with a crunch. However, at that moment those holding the door had stumbled back, leaving it open. And that is when they came in. Gugways reached in and plucked those nearest to the door right out, and with a path clear and no one willing to get close, they started coming in, forcing their oversized bodies through the opening. In a panic, those in the first car exited the back door and tried getting into the second car. Some were pulled away from the sides while trying, as the conductor had, to force the door open. And finally, someone succeeded and the survivors from the first piled into the second, 
and sadly, this created the same opening as the first, and in no time at all, the Gugwe were inside that car as well. Car 3 saw what happened to the first two, and started shooting at anyone or anything trying to get in through the door. All attention was focused there, so they were taken by surprise when the makeshift barricades on the windows burst in and people were drawn out through the windows. Now distracted from the door, it was opened and that car was overrun within minutes. The cars fell like dominoes in this fashion, and every man, woman and child died. The Railroad Through Mad Ape Pass Part 3 Let's get straight into that. The world was on the cusp of war, but Henry had his own battle to wage. And he was too old, too crippled and too sick for a man's war. He felt the cough coming and pulled out another rag and placed it over his mouth. And when it began, it was hard to stop and breathe making him drop to a knee and support himself with the rifle. When it finally ended, he looked down at the red-spotted rag and then wiped his mouth. At first, it was thought that he had tuberculosis, but it was later discovered to be lung cancer. At the time, it was unclear what caused it, but he was sure he knew. And climbing down, he walked out among his army of scarecrows, tied the rag to the neck of one of them, and then returned to his perch. It only took a moment for the smell of fresh blood to reach the Gugwe, downwind of the clearing. They hooted and whooped in excitement, but didn't break ranks. Watching on the mass of humans that had gathered in this almost forgotten place. After the attack that took place here before, they never migrated again, remaining in this area to be sure no trespassers set foot in their territory again. They had grown in number as well. So much so, they had driven out their cousins, the Sasquatch, after ganging up on and killing their leader. The Alpha came down out of the hills with a full force of his troop, and they encircled the clearing, outnumbering the humans four to one. Now, with these numbers, the whooping and hooting turned to roars and snarls. And letting out his own roar, the Alpha gave the signal to attack, and the Kukwe burst from the woodline and charged the humans, craving the taste of their flesh. Moving on. Henry eventually got up and made his way down the hill. It took him the rest of the day to pick through the rubble in hopes of finding someone left alive. As the sun went down, he climbed up the steps of the front passenger car and looking inside, feeling dizzy, he stumbled back, nearly falling down the stairs. It hadn't been the blood or God that had made him so queasy. At this point, he was used to that. No, amidst the carnage was a child's toy. In war, there was always collateral damage, but with what he knew about these monsters, the fate of the town's children made him crumple again. And holding on to the railing, Henry's whole body shook as he cried harder than ever. A wave of heavy warmth drapes over his shoulders looking up to see Grandfather standing there, with his massive hand resting on Henry. His expression was different, sympathetic, maybe even sad. Henry put a hand on Grandfather's and nodded. <sighs> Thanks, big guy. Is it safe to stay the night? He asked him. Grandfather looked off and grunted. More grunts sounded in the distance. Looking back to Henry, Grandfather pointed out a town towards the direction the track had come from. Henry nodded and gathered his things. Ah, just a bit further then, he said, putting his foot down and lifting himself up with his crutch. Grandfather stayed with him as he followed the track back towards civilization. Henry talked as they walked. He wasn't sure if Grandfather really understood or not, but it felt good to have some company. And finally, with the town far behind them, Grandfather grunted again and sat down on the ground. Here? Okay, Henry said, setting down his kit and prepared camp. Henry ate the last of his provisions, still chatting away in the one-way conversation. 
grandfather was, his usual stoic self, seemingly uninterested in Henry's ramblings or food that was offered. Eventually, Henry laid back and looked up at the clear night sky, dotted with stars and a half moon. This was the longest he'd been quiet since leaving town. And when he yawned, he looked over to his companion. Good night, Ollie, he said out of force of habit. Catching his own mistake, he started to correct himself, but saw a small crack of a smile on Grandfather's face. Ah, Ollie, it is then, Henry said with a smile and a tear rolled down his cheek. And closing his eyes and taking a deep breath, Henry drifted off to sleep. Catching a Ride The next morning, Henry woke to the sound of approaching horses. Sitting up, he looked around, but Grandfather, now named Ollie, was gone. Turning towards the source of sound, he saw a carriage bouncing along on a road next to the tracks, coming from the north. He realised he had made camp in between the forks of the road. He gathered his things and snuffed out the smouldering embers of his campfire. The carriage came to a stop a little ways away, and the driver raised a shotgun. "'What you doing there, boy?' asked the old frail-looking man in a wiry voice. Uh, "'Sleeping, but if you could spare a room for a wounded soldier, I'd greatly appreciate it,' Henry said, pulling himself up with his crutches. "'You a deserter?' replied the old man. "'No, sir. My company has all been killed. I'm trying to make it to the nearest fort to report in,' Henry said. Well, there was a long silence before Henry was waved over. "'Ah, come on up. Back's full, but... You can sit with me. What's your name, son? Asked the old man. Prif, I mean Corporal. Henry James Fisher, he said, remembering his field commission. And climbing up next to the old driver, Henry set his crutches on the roof of the carriage and got adjusted in a seat. Ah, Reginald Johnson. You can call me Reggie, if everyone else does, replied the old man and they shook hands. Ah, glad to meet you, Reggie, Henry said with a smile. Ah, you'll change your mind on that once you get to know me. Everyone else does, Reggie said with a toothless grin and a chuckle. Henry laughed and shook his head. And with a crack of the reins, they were off again and rode in silence, taking a path leading away from the mountain. And they rode in silence for a while until Reggie perked up like he suddenly remembered Henry was there. So, what happened to your men? He asked but didn't take his eyes off the trail. I, I honestly don't know, Henry lied. I went out hunting and was attacked by a bear. I tore my leg up pretty bad, but I managed to kill it. I was too far from camp to be hurt, but some natives came along and took me in. They patched me up, but I lost a leg. When I was well enough to go back to camp, everyone was gone and there was blood everywhere. Henry said, hoping a story he'd concocted was good enough. Reggie raised a brow and looked over at his new passenger. Ah, you ain't got a lie to me, sonny. I know what's in them hills. It ain't called Mad Eight Pass for nothing, he said and looked ahead again. Then you know what happened, Henry replied, looking down at the floorboard. Mm-hmm, Reggie confirmed and pulled out some bacon and cheese. You hungry? he asked, offering the food to Henry. And smiling, Henry took it. Thank you. He said and ate a little. You met Standing Bear and Grandfather? Reggie asked and Henry nodded. I nicknamed the big guy Ollie, after my friend that was killed. He said and looked back over his shoulder. Only the peak of the mountain could be seen now, but as they rounded a bend in the path leading into a wooded area, it was gone. An unexpected meeting. It took two days to reach the nearest fort where Reggie and Henry said their goodbyes. After watching the old man drive away, Henry went to the gate and gave his name, rank and regiment number to which he was allowed to enter. Upon walking through the gates, however, he was arrested and put into the stockade. He was told the charge was desertion, but nothing else. And after a week, he was allowed to bathe and dress in a new uniform. He thought this was odd until he was led into the captain's quarters. Snapping to attention, Henry saluted a man that was waiting there for him. President Grant, sir, it's an honour. I'm only going to ask you this one time and I want the truth. If you lie to me, I'll know it. Grant interrupted Henry, 
pointing to a seat across the deck from himself. Well, Henry made his way over to the chair, leaning his new crutch against the wall. You tell me what happened, Grant said, lighting a cigar. Henry opened his mouth to speak to tell the lie he'd come up with, but he couldn't. We, we were attacked by monsters, he said, feeling stupid for saying it out loud. What kind of monsters? Grant asked, not seemingly surprised. Creatures called a Gugwe, Henry answered. Ah, face eaters, Grant asked, still unfazed. Shocked, Henry's eyes went white. You know about them? He asked, and Grant just nodded. Thinking on this for a moment, Henry's shock turned to anger. You knew? And you let them build a railroad through there anyway? He asked, his eyes narrowed and fists clenched. The approved route took the railroad around the mountains. The shortcut was unreported until Adams came back telling of an Indian attack, Grant said, bumping his cigar ash into the bowl on the table. Adams is alive? Henry asked, furrowing his brow. Well, he and another showed up here a few days after the attack. When word reached me, I came out to meet with them. Uh, the other boy, uh, Jennings, Private Jennings. He backed Adam's story at first, but broken, told the truth. Grant said and leaned forward in his seat. Adams was responsible for Rail's end. Well, Henry was taken aback by this revelation. How? he asked, not seeing how a decorated soldier could cause the deaths of so many people. According to Jennings, he, Adams, and another fellow took off on horses when the face eaters attacked. And when they got to Rail's End, they had some of those things on their tail. And instead of going down and warning them, Adams tried to convince the other two to ride with him around the town, using the people there as a distraction while they got away. When Jennings went along with it. Adams stabbed the other when he refused. Grant relayed the shortened version of the story as it had been told to him. My Henry was furious. Where is he? He asked. Not your concern. He and Jellins will be hanged tomorrow. Grant replied, snuffing out his cigar and standing. You, my friend, are going to keep this whole thing to yourself. There will be no public record of the rail company. The people associated with it, your company. Nothing. And if word gets out, more people will go looking and more people will die. It's best just to let it go. You understand? He said and offered his hand. Henry lifted himself from the chair. While he wanted to protest, he understood the reasoning. Yes, sir, he said, shaking Grant's hand. The Return to Civilization After the meeting, Grant went back to Washington. There was no official record of him coming to the fort or even leaving the capital. Henry stayed and watched the execution of Adams and Jennings and then headed on home, having been discharged from the army. The first few years were particularly hard on Henry. The nightmares and pain he had to deal with on a regular basis drove him to the drink. He became bitter and distant, which was so unlike him. Eventually, he climbed out of the bottle long enough to go to a gala with his father, where he met the woman that would become his wife. And meeting Sarah changed his life, getting him back to his old self for a time. He gave up drinking altogether and remained sober after they were married. And they were happy at first, buying a plantation that had fallen into arrears and hiring former route workers as field hands. And sadly, the strain of Henry's constant nightmares drove them apart. Sarah offered to move back home to her parents, but Henry, he wouldn't have it. Though their marriage was fallen apart, he still loved her and allowed her to remain on the plantation while he stayed at his father's. During their separation, Henry took to drinking again and started gambling. When his father refused to give him any more money, Henry, in a drunken stupor, wagered his house and land. Losing everything was the straw that broke the camel's back for Sarah. She left Henry and they divorced soon after. It was during this time that Henry started to notice a worsening cough, most notably were the specks of blood that had begun spitting up during a particularly bad coughing fit. Henry decided he needed a change of scenery, selling what he could and buying a ticket to England 
It was there that he witnessed the demonstration of a new weapon that fired non-stop for almost a minute. Well, he became extremely interested in its invention as it sparked an idea. An idea for revenge. He got to know the man behind the design, Hiram Maxim, from afar and followed the progress over the years, even after returning home to start his preparations. He convinced his father to allow him back in, promising not to drink or gamble. Not long after returning to America, his father passed, leaving Henry a sizable fortune. He really didn't have much need for the money though, other than purchasing the things he needed for his plot. It all comes down to this. When he was ready to go back to Mad Ape Pass, the first thing he did was go to inform Standing Bear of his plan. As it turned out, the tribe had already been forced to move by the army. It took several weeks to find them, but most of the ones he'd known, including Standing Bear, had been killed or died. He was told by one of the elders that Grandfather had also been killed, though by the Gugwe and not the white man. Well, this broke his heart as he thought of them as a second family, but this only fueled his desire to exact revenge on those beasts. Henry set up camp halfway between the pass and a town that had taken root in the last few years. This allowed him to resupply when needed, be close enough to the pass to transport everything, but also remain far enough from town not to draw attention. The day had finally come and Henry had settled in his affairs, sending money he had left to the families of the people who died so many years ago. He also wrote a letter to his ex-wife, Sarah, asking her to forgive him. He wrote in detail what his plan was and that she would probably hear about it unless it was covered up first. He then wished her a long and happy life. It was mid-morning when he set out on the last trip he'd ever make to the train car. When he got there, he unloaded and set up the last piece of equipment to be bought. With that ready, he started standing his scarecrow army to make it appear as if he wasn't the only one here. They would serve as a distraction to buy him time to kill as many as he could. At least, he hoped they'd be distracted by this ruse. It was nearly dusk by the time he'd finished and climbed up on top of the car to check his work. Everything was ready. All he had to do now was wait. It was after dark when they started hooting, their eyes gleaming red in the moonlight, even from this distance. Now and then, he'd see one of them step out of the tree line, but never advanced out much further than that. It was as if they were waiting for something. One stood still a little too long, giving Henry a chance to test the 4570, and with a thunderous boom, the head of the Gugwe snapped back as it fell, and with a red spray spattering the tree behind it, its legs disappeared into the bushes as it was dragged away, and he listened in disgust as they tore the carcass apart. He picked three more off this way, reloading a fresh round into the magazine each time he fired and worked the lever. He wanted it full when the time came. He loved how well the heavy rounds worked, even though the rifle kicked like a mule. Once he tied the bloody rag onto one of the scarecrows, they got really excited, giving him a few more chances to snipe some off. He loaded the last round he had to spare, giving him one fully loaded gun and so he wasted no more shots on those that poked their heads out. And when the roar started, he knew that the time, the time had come. And with one booming roar coming from the Alpha, the Gugwe flooded the field. Henry took aim and fired, working the action and fired again. He quickly ran out of rounds and had only killed two or three of the ones he'd aimed for. Dropping a rifle, he whipped the sheet of the final piece of equipment he had installed earlier that day. It was the latest model of the gun he'd seen while on his trip, though the name had changed. This was a Vickers MK1 with a modified 2,500 round belt in a crate to one side of the gun. The gun and crates were set on a swiveling platform of his own design to be rotated 360 degrees. Henry worked the charging handle, took aim, and opened fire. The sudden burst of fire took him by surprise, but made him grin wildly 
He hit the trigger again, holding it down as he strafed one side and then turned around and strafed the other. He watched the British 303 rounds rip through the Gugwe like a hot knife through butter. And whether it took more than one to kill them, he wasn't sure since the rate of fire put multiple rounds, striking any given target at any time. The Gugwe finally closed in on the camp and started attacking his army, ripping the scarecrows apart with no resistance. It had worked. This gave him even more time to mow them down. And off to one side, he heard and felt a heavy thud on the roof of the train car. Turning, he saw that one of them had jumped onto the back of the train and was now charging at him. Oh, Henry swung the gun and fired a burst into it, killing it with ease. Oh, its body toppled off the top of the train as more piled on at either end. He fired on the ones at the back, swung around and took out the ones on the front, and then turned his focus back on the ones on the sides. His army was almost depleted, and so he didn't have much time left. He hit the trigger again and yelled a battle cry. Die, you bastards! Die! And just as the last round fired, his legs were swept out from under him. He hit his head on the mount platform, but managed to hold on to the grips of the gun as his left leg was torn away. He crawled over to the open hatch and dropped in, put on a rope to shut and locked the hatch behind him. He chuckled a little, thinking it funny that that was the second time one of those things had taken his leg. Final moments. Henry lifted himself up and into the chair he'd placed in the cargo car that he was now trapped in. He'd reinforced it because he knew he'd need a little more time before meeting his fate. He'd never intended to survive this trip. He was dying already, after all. The idea of going peacefully in his sleep had been dashed the day he lost his leg. Either by nightmares or this damn sickness, he knew he was going to go out suffering. A coughing fit started up, spurred on by all the excitement of the last few minutes. He coughed into his hands, spitting blood all over them to which he wiped away on his pants leg. And there was barely any light shining in, but what little did filter through the gaps in the boards and raging monsters outside shone on a stool in front of him, and sitting there was his pipe, a tin of tobacco and a box of matches. Henry took his time, picking up the old pipe and tapping out the ash that had been there for years. He used his shirt towel to polish it out and then opened the tin and packed the pipe. And picking up the box, he sat back in his seat and stuck one, lighting his pipe with a few puffs. He tuned out the roars, snarls and growls. He paid no mind to the banging and splintering of wood all around him. He simply sat back and smoked his pipe. As he blew out a puff of smoke, he heard a voice. <coughs> really, brother? Do you have to smoke that in here? Oliver said, standing there before Henry. He looks just how Henry had remembered him, making his lip quiver and a tear roll down his cheek. Ah, stoic. I need this, Henry replied to the spectre. I have a theory on that stuff, Oliver said, pointing to the pipe. Henry coughed and nodded. Really? Ah, let's have it, he said, recalling a conversation about Ollie's uncles. When Ollie had finished, Henry tilted his head. Your point? He asked in a wheezing voice as he started coughing again. My point is, if you keep puffing away on that thing, I ask going to kill you one day, Oliver said smiling this time around. Henry chuckled, taking a long draw from the pipe and blowing it towards his friend. No, it won't, he said and leaned to the side. He picked up a fuse and held it up to the pipe, drawing on it to make the embers burn hotter and igniting the fuse. And Oliver smoked. Ah, you got me there, brother, he said, and they both started laughing. Henry continued to laugh and smoke, even after his friend had vanished. The ever-growing trails of fuses lighting up the cargo car, revealing the dozens of kegs and casks of black powder he had amassed over the years. Henry's laugh, as well as the roars of the Gugwe, was silenced by the deafening BOOM of the explosion. The train and everything in the blast ratio were obliterated. Further still, the shock wave leveled the trees and sent shrapnel in every direction, killing or maiming anything that got caught in its wake. Of the massive troop, only a handful survived, retreating in different directions. 
The explosion was heard and felt all the way back to town, prompting an investigation. Well, there wasn't much left to get an idea of what had happened, but word got back to Washington and the whole thing was cleaned up and swept under the rug. Mad Ape Pass was renamed and a road was built through it to encourage settlement. Settlements and civilization meant the displacement of animals and monsters that once roamed the area. And it did in fact work as the good way they never returned. Epilogue Two little boys ran around the yard, playing and giggling while their mother watched from the front porch. She smiled as she looked at them, sighing happily when she felt her husband's hands on her shoulders. Oh, it's getting late, he said, leaning down to kiss her head. Ah, let them play a little while longer, she said, looking up to him with a smile. Ah, five minutes, he said, rolling his eyes as he turned and went back in. She nodded and looked back to her sons. After the allotted time was up, she stood and called out to them. Come on, boys, time for baths and bed, she said, getting groans and grumbles in return. She laughed and ushered them in and up the stairs. After bathing the boys, she tucked them into bed. Her youngest was asleep right away, but her oldest it was a little more troubled. Come on, you. You need your sleep, she said. Oh, fine. He groaned and got into bed, pulling the covers up. Mama, he said, stopping at her door. Yes, she asked, turning to him. Remember how you told me that Pa wasn't my real Pa? He asked and she raised a brow. I said he wasn't your father. He is your Pa, she corrected him. Right, can, can, can you tell me about my real Pa? He asked and she frowned for a moment and then smiled. Sitting on the edge of his bed, she ran her fingers through his hair. And he looked so much like his father, even at this young age. She thought about what to say, recalling the news of his death and the strange details. And she would not have believed any of it if not for having heard him recall what had happened before they met and the letter that she had received. And with a smile, she looked at her son in the eyes and said, Your father... He was a hero, Henry. Your father was a hero. Wow, 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 wow. Definitely another one. Wow. Absolutely riveting what a tapestry of horror there put together by the incredible mind of James Williams, author of the uh, Fighting For My Life series. That we just uh, completed last month. Huge thank you to you, James, for penning this one so quick. I'm so happy you find inspiration from the channel and the feedback from the listeners, and I'm sure they're enjoying your writing style just as much as I am. Can't wait to see what else you produce next. Guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really, really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew? Of course, if you're an aspiring writer or just fancy having a crack at things, why not get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is dmtforestofear at gmail.com. I hope everybody's doing well this week and had a fantastic week at work or school, whatever it is that you do. And I hope you're all trying to keep fit and focused as possible during these testing times. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>